This morning I would like to look at a, something that you may come across of talking about God's quickening voice. Sometimes pregnant mothers feel a quickening in, with their baby. And I just, something's alive there. It's a feeling that we have. And sometimes theologians and different people, they talk about this quickening voice because it has to be there in their theological concept that you can't, when we're dead in sin, there's that depravity in all facets of our being that somehow we need the power of God to overcome that depravity so there's a sovereignty. So it has nothing to do with you, but he awakens us and then we're able to hear his commands. So you can preach the gospel to someone that God has not awakened yet and because he hasn't done that work yet, that person will not hear. You can sing just as I am and you can sing 17 verses of just as I am to get people to come to the gospel. And if God has not awakened them yet, made them alive so they now can listen to what God says and do what God says, then your efforts are not going to be rewarded. You need that quickening voice to make people alive so they can heed the gospel and to live the life of a Christian. So here's an illustration. Jesus said, Lazarus, with a loud voice, come forth. Did not Jesus have to make Lazarus alive first before he could come forth? Did that happen, had to happen first? In their idea, he did. We'll come back to this at the end of the lesson. But because of that, that's supposed to establish that we're dead in sin, not talk about physical death, but we're dead in sin and we cannot hear the commands to come forth, start to come forth uh, until he quickens us with his voice. Kind of hard to explain. Don't know exactly how it feels, but it has to happen. Is, are we basing how we become Christians upon that illustration? Some use it, and it does have an impact. I, well, maybe he did get him alive first before he came forth. Or does the scripture help us understand that? What I want us to realize is that the spiritual quickening doesn't happen apart from the word, the gospel that has been written. How do we know that? If you turn with me to John, the fifth chapter, here we find... Jesus talking about what's going to happen in the future, but what is happening now in the present tense. And he speaks about this being dead. And John, John 5 and verse, and verse 25, John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour cometh and now is. Now, let me just jump ahead because we're finding verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tombs shall hear his voice. That's a Lazarus illustration. That's going to happen, and don't marvel because all will hear his voice to come forth. They're dead. They're going to come forth. But the hour now is, he says, back to verse 25, the dead, the dead shall hear his voice. And shall hear the voice of God, and they that hear shall live. You're speaking to a dead man. Yeah, dead spiritually. We're going to be taking care of the dead physically in verse 28. Dead spiritually. It's now happening. They shall hear his voice. For as the Father hath life in himself, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He can give life to a dead man, is the scripture that we're looking at. And it's not an inward voice that weakens us. And then we listen to the word. It is the word that's being presented. In fact, in John the 6th chapter, verse 63, when the followers of Jesus are peeling off one at a time, they're all deserting him because he said, you got to eat my flesh. you got to drink my blood. That's not the Lord's Supper. That's partaking of him as the bread of life. And they're thinking in literal terms, with a sense of physical terms. But it's literally complied in the spiritual realm. Because verse 63, 
When Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? To whom shall we go? In verse 63, it is a spirit that giveth life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and are life. The words are life. That can wake up a dead man as he's preaching the good news of the gospel. The dead hear. No, the dead can't hear. And it takes a separate voice to be setting forth the teaching that will, then they, they can... Then they can hear you. This is happening. No spiritual quickening. This is my first point. It doesn't happen apart from the word. You never have a quickening voice, some mysterious thing, and they're alive. There's always the word of God proclaimed. Not an exception to that. And that should be instructed to begin with. If it's happening, it's happening at the same time. But I don't see this voice. I don't hear it here from the lips of Jesus. I also know the Bible speaks of one spiritual quickening for those who are dead in sin. And that's this word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, I think this is firmly established. Seeing you purified your souls and your obedience to the truth. They had obeyed the truth of the gospel. They repented because they had faith in Christ. They confessed Christ. They were baptized into Christ. It says, I want you to love each other. Have an unhypocritical love. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Love one another from the heart fervently. Because that relationship. What's happened to all of us? Having been begotten again. Been begotten again. You know, begotten again. I've been born again. I made alive. And again, because we were alive physically, Nicodemus, weren't we? But he's speaking about a spiritual birth. Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, out through the flesh of physical life that we understand that happens. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through what means? Well, we have to have a you know, quickening voice and then you get the word into it. No, it says the word of God, it lives like Christ had life in himself to give life to those who hear him. His word is spirit and is life. This seed is, it's, it lives and abides. And he gives a comparison, all flesh is as grass, the glory thereof is the flower thereof, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of the Lord can we tell me what that word of the Lord is? Is that that quickening voice or is it the gospel? Well, he'll tell you, this is the word of good tidings which was preached to you. Not what was articulated in you and you didn't realize now I can go hear the preacher. There's one quickening and that comes from the word of life. And it is the gospel that is preached that wakes up the dead in sin. That's where I'm going. And that's where we find these passages setting forth there. We're begotten through the word of God. There's not a quickening voice and then we come alive through the word. It's just the word to a dead man. Dead in sin has the power to awaken them and move them to obey the gospel. Let's look at a third point. Spiritually dead people can read what is written and believe and live. I don't need a mysterious, quickening voice. Because I can read. Because we don't have miracles today. But we have miracles recorded. They have been written down and they've been written down for a purpose. And John comes to the end of this, of his gospel. And he makes this statement. Many other signs therefore did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. You can either count seven or eight, depending on how you count miracles. But there are not a lot of them there. But the ones are very important to see the power that Jesus has over all of his creation. Transcending natural law. But these were written down, John says. Why? What's the purpose? What's the power of these things? But these things are written that ye may believe. Apparently, I'm not a believer yet. I can read and now believe. I can read what is written 
and that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life in his name. Apparently did not believe yet, and I didn't have life. I'm just coming to the Gospel of John. My good friend wants to study with me the Gospel of John to convert me to Jesus Christ. That's fine. Matthew, Mark, Luke will take care of that too, but you like John, we'll go to John. Seems like a popular one in, in saving souls. We'll go there. And while, oh, if I could have been there when he turned the water to wine and all that water was there at that, at that wedding feast, I would be a believer. Really? Well, we weren't there. Well, you're going to have to have a quickening voice wake you up before we can get into further study of John. No. John himself said these things are written that you might believe and believing you may have life in his authoritative name. Where does he have establishing his authority being from God? Miracles. Miracles. It confirmed the messenger when the gospel is being preached. And when Jesus was telling people on an individual basis, follow me, follow me, follow me. I never read where he told a group to do that. It's on an individual basis. It's a very personal thing. We're all are dead in sin. And the point is, is that there's one spiritual awakening that will come to our response to the gospel. Because it has the power to awaken us. And that's what we're seeing when we look at scripture. Where is the quickening voice here? It's what's written. I am therefore able to believe and I can have eternal life. Apparently, I had not been a believer and I didn't have eternal life. I was dead in sin. But I read John. And you know what? Let's talk about the book of Acts and see what I need to do to respond to that gospel. Where was the quickening voice? I, I didn't hear, hear one. I'm just reading what's been written. The word has that power. Turn with Isaiah, the 55th chapter. In Isaiah 55, we realize that God's ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts than our thoughts, thoughts and he gives us an illustration. Let's see his illustration. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And here's the illustration. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, it's on a mission. There's the moisture coming down from heaven. What does it do? It watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, and give a seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. So my, my thoughts, my ways, higher than yours. But now he focuses in upon nature. He said, this is what my word is like. Notice how comprehensive, how powerful, and how comprehensive to things of life that this word is. Moisture. It's like moisture. You can get it from rain. You can get it from snow. But it comes to earth. It doesn't come back to me. Void, it's on a mission. And it prepares the ground. The word prepares the ground. So when you plant the seed where it has life, God got that one too. You get life in there, it comes forth and buds. And when it comes forth, you take a few of those grains and you put it in the barn and you'll have seed for the sower, but I'm gonna have my wife kind of mush that all together we're going to have bread for the eater that's me i got preparing the ground bringing forth the grain providing for the purpose of another planting we're going to have bread today so is my word it doesn't come back void it accomplishes that which i please it prospers in that which i sent it now, where is the quickening voice there? Because, oh, the quickening voice has to prepare that heart to receive your word. Don't you understand that? No, I think the word can do that too. It's like rain. 
it's like snow. It could prepare the ground for the seed to blossom. Well, it's not, it's, it, the seed's not the word of God. I've got a parable for you. And look, if you want to study that one, the word is a seed. There's different types of ground. ground. But what this word does, it there produces the grain and it produces, it, it accomplishes its purpose. Seed for the sower, bread for the eater. And it accomplishes everything that I sent it. What? My word accomplishes all of that. It prepares the heart. It prepares and produces the fruit. And it accomplishes its end. Right on the table that your wife can make good bread with. And we've got another planting we can do tomorrow in the barn. Or next, next spring, next fall, whatever. It's the rain. It's the seed that has life in it. It is the fruit that comes from it. It is accomplishes all of its purposes. And you won't, well, before that can do that, we've got to have a quickening voice to wake you up? No, no. This passage is used to teach that. But it doesn't teach that, does it? The word accomplishes it. And it will not come to back to me void. That's why we preach that gospel. And they don't want to hear it today. But they may want to hear it another time. When life is turned upside down. And they want some answers. Will my dog go to heaven? Might give you an opportunity to teach them a gospel. You never know what it will be. Will my cat be in heaven with me? All sorts of things can cause people to turn to God. And we live in a time where we have that word and we realize it's the rain, it's the snow, it's the seed, it produces the fruit and the grain, and it will accomplish everything that, we, that God wants it to accomplish. You have no quickening apart from the word of God, and the word of God will soften your heart. It will instruct your mind. It will charge you. This is the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And I'm tired of living in sin. I think I'll try that way. And that word's written down confirms the things that we need. This morning, scripture reading, Christ read in Acts 16 about Lydia. Did God not open her heart? That's exactly what he did. Did he do that apart from the word of God? Nobody opened her heart. To do what? To give heed, to put into practice the things that she'd already heard. Did the quickening voice come and say, no, all right, I got, the, I got the place prepared now, now I'm going to talk to you about the Word of God. They were there in a place of prayer. Probably indicating they didn't have a synagogue for the Jews, but he knew where they'd meet by the river to pray, and here was Lydia. And he preached. He taught her things. He taught her things, that, apparently, how to respond to the gospel. Because she was baptized. Wouldn't people just get baptized and I will tell you why you need to be baptized? No, he, he preached to her. It comes to the word of God. And her heart was opened by what? The word of God to put into practice what she heard. Does the Lord do a quickening magical thing? It doesn't say so. But the word of God accomplishes its purpose. Yes, he opened her heart and he will open your heart today. When you meditate and realize he died on the cross for you. He went there willingly, though it was terrible for him to th think and contemplate. There was never a time when he was backing off. He just showing you how much it's, it's painful. But thy will be done. He knew that when he came from heaven. He was not backing off what he's going to do. He went to the cross for you and me. So that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. And the Bible confirms that he's from God, not only by his miracles, but it's, it's made to know because God raised him from the dead. And because he's raised from the dead, we can have the hope of heaven. And he's the only way to the Father. I read that and I study that and that word softens my heart. But there will never be a quickening in your heart apart from listening to that gospel message. It never will happen. Is that because you're not part of the elect and God never gave you a voice to, so you could hear, your, hear the word? You try that in judgment. 
when I told you about my son. I told you why he came. I raised him so you could see the power of God behind him. And no one forced you. It's just someone just taught you the gospel. And you refused it. Because you're waiting for me to give you a little quickening voice so you could hear it all. That won't work with God. And what a horrible place to be in when God has sacrificed so much to save us. And we rejected his message that he's preserved for us. Let's come back to the quickening voice. Lazarus, come forth. And do you know what the very next verse says? He that was dead. No, not he that was now quickened alive. He that was dead. That's the very next verse in your illustration. He that was dead came forth. Yeah, but he had a while to sit up and take off the grave clothes and get that napkin off his face. He, 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 he was, he'd been alive for a while because he got that quick and he voice. It had to happen. He comes out with the grave clothes. He's bound with his hands and his legs. He's bound. He's got the napkin bound on him. And he sat there until Jesus told him to come forth because he's alive. He that was dead came forth with the grave clothes as tight and bound as they were, he said, let him loose, let him go. Quickening voice was the command to come forth. Tabitha, arise! Oh, we had to have a quickening voice before, she could, before he could arise? No, the command to rise and resurrection from the dead, not a halfway place between death and, and coming out of the tomb arising from your deathbed it happened at the command and that quickening voice was the command to come forth and that's what we have written and he that was dead came forth that's pretty simple to see so we talk about our relationship with God Paul when you're back there called Saul at the very beginning you heard a message from the Lord. And we read that the Lord says, I'm sending thee. I'm sending you, Saul. And here's your mission. To open their eyes. Yeah, they're blind. They're dead in their sin. That they may turn from darkness. Open eyes. Oh, I'm going to turn from darkness to light. I can see now. And the power of Satan unto God. I'm in pretty bad shape. Satan's got me. But Saul, I'm glad you came today because I can turn from the power of Satan unto God. I'm glad you came today because I can, through, through you coming, I can receive the remission of sins and I can think about heaven in a good way. I have an inheritance among them that are set apart from this world of sin by faith in me, Jesus says. How encompassing is that of my relationship with eternity, my relationship with God, and my relationship with my blindness in my mind, it's dark. Saul, I'm sending you. Did Saul say, Lord, you can preach all day to those people. You've got to speak first. You've got to have a quickening voice. Don't send me. Why do you need me? Just. Do your thing. Do your miracle. Open their eyes because no word can open it. Really? Paul, who then was Saul, was coming there. And what was he doing? Well, just drop down to verse 20 and find out. I was not disobedient to this 
heavenly vision or the heavenly vision. But I declared he's preaching. He's teaching. And he's teaching that they should repent and turn to God. Doing works worthy of repentance. Paul, you can't do that yet because they can't hear you. They're dead. They can. Through the preaching of the gospel, their eyes are opened. Well, that just may be for a select few. Notice the three dots after declared. Fill it in for me. Would you read your Bible? And you realize that I did it first in Damascus. I did it to them in Jerusalem. I made the same declaration to them in the areas of Judea. And let me add to it, and the Gentiles too. Jew, Gentile, regardless of where they are. I declared the same thing to all of them. Because here's the gospel message. Now I need you to respond. Repent. And do works worthy of repentance. That's how... You respond to the gospel. Now only in baptism like Lydia. But what good is baptism if you're not going to turn from your sins? All of that indeed was together. Would it be blasphemy to ask Saul, Saul, why do you preach? Don't you know that you're preaching the gospel when God has not awakened their heart already, is that it's fruitless? All the words life, it softens the heart, prepares for the, the seed. It is the seed. It produces, it accomplishes all the purposes to save men from sin. To the point of having my sins removed and the hope of heaven secure in one passage. That's why I preach. And that word can soften your heart. But it's, it's what, that's how God awakens us. And then we're ready to respond so we can have life. When does that happen? Look at the comparison of these two verses. In Ephesians, the second chapter and verse 5, we praise the grace of God. We praise God for his love. We praise God for his rich mercy. He's great in mercy, he's great in love, or with he loved us, that even, verse 5, even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Because look what I did. No. By grace have you been saved. Notice in verse 4, but God, while we were dead in our trespasses like you, if not obeying the gospel and living your life, you're walking along. He, he pictures you. We're children of wrath because his wrath is upon us. We're fulfilling the lust of our flesh. We're going about doing what we want to do. And then all of a sudden, who breaks in on the scene? But God, with a small, still voice to awaken you? No, God, who is rich in mercy and his love, been expressed in giving his son in the mercy to have your sins forgiven. By grace have you been saved. But you're dead in your sins. And he made it possible for you to be alive with Christ. When does that happen? When can I be united with Christ and be alive? Look at Colossians 2 and verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you once were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. He raises us. And you being dead through your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, I say to you, make alive together with him. We've been raised with him. We're together with him alive. When does that take place? Baptism. And what we see in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, is that here's the order. We're dead. We're baptized. And then we become alive. The gospel is the seed and we respond to that gospel, confessing who Jesus is, repenting of our sins. And we're baptized into his death, Paul says. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Christians, you're not living the life that you ought to be lived. Don't you know? Are you eager? Thought we were baptized. We're baptized in his death. He takes us back when we're not living right. Back to our baptism. 
what the purpose of it was. How did we respond to that gospel? You were baptized into Christ's death. We were therefore baptized into death. That's where you and I died to sin. We can't live there, there anymore. But we were raised with him. We were buried and we're raised with him unto a newness of life. I'm begotten again. I'm dead in my sins if I ignore the gospel message. There's not a quickening voice apart from the message of the gospel, but I'm still dead if I listen to the gospel and not respond so I can have life. That's the reality of every one of us in this audience. Either we have done that or we've yet to do it. And I ask you this morning, don't put this off. Realize that there's not going to be a voice that says, hey, you're alive, you're okay. Unless it's Satan's voice. Because you know in Christ, this word, this gospel will open your eyes. Or we can reject it. We've got a conscience that can become very harsh and hard. And that's a very difficult place to be. But I hope I'm speaking to people whose heart can be softened by the word of God. And the love of God in sending his son. And the power that says he's worthy of my trust in my life. Because he was perfect and sinless. His way is there that we can go through difficult times. I can even face death and not back off my hope. He has, you can't take away my, my a hope of heaven. And to have that type of faith that's built from the word of God, we trust it. And we preach that to you. Listen to this powerful word and obey that word while you have that opportunity right now as we stand and as we sing.